Hey everyone, welcome to The Essential Show. It is your host, Stephen Heyman, joined by our co-host, co Jonathan Claudio. How you doing, man? You good? Yeah, I'm good. Good. <laughs> so we are joined by a very special guest today. By the way, this is our very first episode, so thank you guys for listening to our podcast. Please like and subscribe. Please follow us on Instagram. We'll have all of the social media tags below. There's going to be a lot of content kind of pumping out for the next forever, so... Thank you guys for watching. But we are joined by a special guest. This is one of my mentors in life, um, a great friend. This is Pastor Michael Stack. So what's up, bro? How are you doing? Good. How are you? Hey, Jaya, let's give him a clap. Come on, Brendan. Give him a clap. Uh, we also have our cameraman behind us, uh, Brendan. So, uh, Brendan, how you doing, man? You good? Doing amazing, man. Can't <laughs> complain. Like yeah. All the way back beyond here. Oh. <laughs> We love you. So Sporting a Nirvana t-shirt. Exactly, a Nirvana t-shirt. You didn't so, know anything about Nirvana until Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is true, bro. Yeah. I, nah, I, I used to sing, uh, what's the other song? The, what's the other song? Never mind. Well, 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 they had a song on Rock Band that I, I used to listen to. Uh, it probably smells like Teen Spirit. No, it's um, Float On, I think. I oh my gosh, sorry guys. Float On My Spirit. Smells like Teen Spirit. Oh. What did you say? I said Teenager. Oh my god! I don't know. Oh I mean, I, I don't know of them. I don't that, to them. But you don't know you're getting old until yeah. the music you knew is cutting edge, is playing on classic creepy. rock stations. That song name sounds creepy. Ah. So, all right. So, Pastor Mike, just give us a quick uh, overview of just who you are. Give us a quick overview of your story. And, um, guys, so today we are going to be talking about the early church and we're just going to be talking about mm -hmm. the, just the church as a whole and some theology stuff so tell us about your life story how you've come to christ and how you found this love in theology okay um i was raised catholic and then like a lot of catholics i strayed from the church for a long time uh came to christ when i was 44 years old um wow. yeah and i'm fi i'll be 50 next week so so six years mm -hmm from, you know, completely lost to, to pastor. I mean, it's been an, an amazing journey. And my love for theology came from my first Bible teacher. So uh, Pastor Joe, who sat down with me, we'd go to Chick-fil-A and we'd open the Word and we would read through the scriptures and he would point things out to me that I might not have seen before. And I would question things like, as, well, one of the first things I questioned, he, he was kind of surprised I picked up on at that at that stage. I was like, what does he mean by election? He was like, aha. He goes, you're actually paying attention. I was like, so he was, we'll get into that later because that's not something we need to discuss right now. And obviously that's a theology, you know, a piece of theology that I've examined over the years, but that's, you know, that's where it started. Um, I started in, uh, in a uh, pastoral counseling program at Liberty University, a master's in pastoral counseling, took a uh, master's, you know, in, you know, in theology course um, and everything that we did in school, you had to cite scripture. So you just didn't write a paper about a thing. You had to write a paper about a thing and then cite scripture inside of that. So you had, it had to make sense from an academic standpoint, but everything you produced in that program had to make sense, you know, from a biblical standpoint. Mm -hmm. I so I really learned how to use scripture academically. So, and, and I think that increased my thirst for a, a better understanding of God's word, how to rightly use God's word, because I, I didn't have the benefit of growing up in Awana learning how to memorize all the verses. Yeah, right. And you now today, when I try to commit stuff like that to, to memory, it's hard. Uh, I mean, that great. I mean, get your children in those programs so they can memorize those verses when their brains are open enough to be able to do that kind of stuff. Because later in life, I mean, trying to memorize something now, it's hard. And the older you get, I believe it becomes harder and harder. So I like being able to be able to handle the word, go to certain places and find what I'm looking for. And I also, I mean, I have no shame. I'll go online and look things up. Um, you know, the, you know, use the, the, you know, what does the Bible say and, and things like that to find out, you know, deeper into the word. Because if you have a question, God's word always has an answer. And, and I, I, theologically, I think that's one of the neatest things is if you have a question, God always has an answer for you. And also the Bible being something that, you know, you feel like you're getting some kind of divine inspiration from God or the Holy Spirit of God is talking to you. You have to validate it against the word yeah. because God's never going to tell you something that that doesn't line up with the word. And so, again, being understand, being able to discern what 
you know, what is, you know, good and evil, but also what is, what sounds right and what is actually righteous. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of stuff going on out there that sounds good. It, you hear it and you're like, wow, that's amazing. That's awesome. But if, and then if you check it against God's word, it may be false, even though it sounds good. Yeah. And that's something that we, you know, we talked about regularly when we listen to preaching and, and, and preachers out there is just because it sounds good doesn't mean it is good. And you have to be able to validate these things against the word of God. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, Ruslan does a good, uh, he did, if, by the way, Ruslan subscribed to him. He's very good. Yeah. Ruslan, yeah. KD. He's a savage. Oh, Ruslan, yeah. if you're watching this, we want to interview you yeah. next. So just saying, I want to, I want to tag you in this clip. Oh. Um, <clears throat> so, but. Exactly. We need one. You, well, well, they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll be we'll be the subscribers. Yeah, we'll be the three. Yeah, four. There'll be four. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I mean, if we four. if we're okay, Stacy might subscribe. But yeah, of course. Yeah. So like he he has this uh, really good thing. He said like like anything that you're teaching or if if you say something that does and if you say something about God or to that subject and you don't have a and and, and if there's no scriptural context and it's not right, it's not true. You know and what and like what you're saying has to, has to match the word of God. Period. You know everything that that you say, <coughs> there there has to be a backup of scripture of what you're saying. Well, you're a preacher. Yeah. Right? So I'm I'm not gifted like that. I yeah. mean, I can get up there and do a lesson. Mm -hmm. I'm more of a teacher. Yeah. But you being a preacher, what do you start with first? Your topic, or the Bible? The, my, my topic usually comes from the scripture. <laughs> so, yeah, I start Right, with so you yeah. start with scripture. Mm -hmm. So you should be, the, the scripture should be the, let's talk about, like, in a blacksmith shop, you have an anvil yeah. and a hammer. And then you take the anvil, which is, it's bolted down to the bench that is cemented to the floor. Yeah. It is not going to move. And let's say that's the word of God. Mm -hmm. It is the immovable anvil in your when you're when you're giving when you're coming up with a a message yeah the metal that you're going to work on that's your that's your that's your message that's your preaching and you're trying to bend your preaching around the word of god and you're going to hit it and hit it and hit it until it is useful mm -hmm. against the word of god because if you do it the other way around the the chances of creating errors are great yeah so if you come up with a nice cute little talk and then you try to insert scripture into it and i mean and granted when i've done you know messages i've gone both ways yeah but if you're trying to slide scripture into you know a topical discussion it it falls apart yeah and you've probably had some really cool messages and then you started trying to frame it up in scripture and it disintegrated in front of you You're like yeah what was i thinking yeah, for sure. Yeah, I used to I used to do like a topic and then have my points and then add um, um, scripture into it. Now I kind of try to stay in the same passage because what I find is that when I'm crafting up like a message, I, I'm kind of sort of not starting to not like when I have scriptures from all different books and all different chapters. It kind of it kind of doesn't it kind of doesn't give it like a uh, like a theme kind of sort of if I'm like if like. If I'm jumping from like Matthew to Proverbs or something, well, whatever. But if I'm jumping from like Revelation to like Habakkuk, like it's it's hard to like, you know what I mean? It's like I've been I've been kind of trying to keep a theme when I preach because it's easier for people to follow. And One the first thing that Joe taught me when going through Scripture is context above context, precept upon precept. Mm -hmm. So you can't just take a verse. Yeah. You gotta look. You gotta read at least the verse before it and the verse after it to mm -hmm. grab context about what God is saying. Yeah. So you can you can take a lot of verses and I mean, sadly, and one of the I I think is one of the the biggest criticisms of modern Christianity is they weaponize scripture. Yeah. They use scripture to shame people. They use scripture to, um, you know, cast, you know, create division. You can use scripture to do a lot of things. If you're mishandling the word of God, there's a, there's a lot of evil that can come from that. But yeah, like I, I really kind of want to change the idea of let's not have it where like it's either topical or expository. Let's bring them both together. Because I think a topic with expository preaching 
might be the best way. Well, I mean, that's how Russo. I mean, yes, I mean, from watching and he Russo does on, a good job he, of that. He talks about a topic, but then he exposits a whole passage, and I learned so much through that through that kind of a teaching. Also, well, his testimony too. Mm-hmm. He also put his life testimony and a bunch of other things. Too, no, he used but, to be a church employee. That, yeah. that testimony. That was crazy. Yeah. That was crazy. That was deep. But yeah, and I feel like that 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 is probably the new way, or the probably the most um the smartest way to teach in 2022 for sure but you bend you bend the message around the scripture not vice versa mm-hmm. so don't bend the scripture to fit your message bend your message to fit the scriptures yeah and i think you're right i mean <clears throat> and that's you, hard. You, you go in and you say you want to preach on racism you know racism is sin mm-hmm. we know this yeah but there's no passage that says oh racism is sin yeah so you have to take a couple of verses and you know and frame that up to support you know why is racism sin? Yeah. Is there a historical context for racism? Yeah, yeah there is. Yeah. Is there a biblical context? Yes. There's one in um, Song of Songs. Yeah. I can point out. And people also don't under understand that when sermon prep is hard to it's hard to not put your personal emotions and feelings into into the word of God. Because you can because you can bend the scripture to support your worldview that might not line up with scripture. You know what I mean? And so it, that's, I mean, people really think you can just write a sermon and just talk. I mean, no, this, this ain't a TED talk. No, I'm reading a, a, I'm reading a passage and I am putting all of my self opinions and all of my ways of thinking aside. And I am literally reading and learning from the words of God. And I'm taking that and writing those to a topic to teach it to people, you know, there were like, um, there, like, there were a, a lot of things that I didn't understand. I, I'm not gonna say that I didn't agree with it. I was just very ignorant to understand. And through teaching and prepping, I've learned to understand those things. But you know, a lot of preachers and teachers they put their opinions over the word of God. Oh. So yeah, sorry for the segue. Yeah. Any comments that you wanna uh, make at all? So what school did you go to? Um... Did you, did you study um, Bible um, classes? Or? Uh, Liberty University. Okay. Yeah, so I have a master's in pastoral counseling from Liberty University. Okay. Cool. I, I knew that. I just wanted them to know that. Yeah, so yeah, there's a master's in pastoral counseling from Liberty, master's in pastoral counseling and discipleship mm. from Liberty University. Okay. Good. So basically, you found your love of theology from just the... Chick-fil-A talks. Yeah, from just the side of just like, you just, you're very informative. I mean... I, I said earlier, you're a nerd at heart. You're yeah, uh, I, yeah, I'm totally a nerd. Uh, I love school. I didn't when I was younger, but now, I mean, I, I love school. I, I place an emphasis on academics. Um, do you do you think you're gonna go back after all your after like everyone's like graduated and stuff, or after all the kids are out of the yeah. house? I don't know. I, I really, I, I mean, it really is up to God. Mm-hmm. I mean. I've not really pondered that deeply. I mean, we've got, so we have five kids ranging from ages seven to 18. Yeah. So it's going to be a while before Julian's mm-hmm. out of the house yeah. and I will not be a young man when that happens. Yeah. So I don't know. That, that's really up to the Lord. Mm-hmm. If he, you, having received a calling on your life, you know what that is. I mean, if God's saying, go do, you go do. Yeah, exactly. And when it comes to something like that, because I mean, the next, the next academic stage is a big undertaking. It would yeah. be three to five years of, a lot of work. Yeah. And I don't know if I want to take that away from my family. True. Respect. I have a question for the two of you. So you guys are pastors. You guys speak a sermon. Um, what, what is it that you guys aim for? I guess, like, is it like, like when you're preaching, are you guiding the perceptions of people to understand God's word and the morality and the principles? Like, what's, what's like your mindset, I guess, when you're up there ministering? Well, the mindset should be <clears throat> to get those that are listening to you closer to God. Right. That should be the mindset. Yeah. But when you're working on a sermon, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I've approached it going, okay, well, what's going to sound good? So what's going to sound good coming from the podium? Yeah. What, you know, what's going to get people interested? So you have to take off those worldly expectations and ask God, okay, what is it you want me to convey to them? Yeah. How do you want to work 
in order to reach the hearts of the people you're speaking to. Yeah. I, I personally believe that every every preacher, every teacher has their own uh, kind of like conviction. So every preacher has their own topic that they kind of drive hard on. You know, so for me, I'm more of a spiritual for mation type like habits and uh, practices. That's kind of where I kind of teach a lot of when I come to, to adults, you know. Um, if I was to take Darren, for example, Darren is, is big on like God created you. He's like he's big on just the human design of, of, of people. So I, like I believe every pastor has their own kind of um, topic or everything kind of revolves around one thing for them. But the goal for every pastor should be is to teach a sound word that matches up with the, with the word of God and the Rema word of God. And as Pastor Mike says, something that once that's something that that draws people closer to Jesus because mm -hmm. theoretically we are supposed to decrease and he's he, he is supposed to increase God God is supposed to be speaking through us to the people so and, and if you're in the flow you know you, you talk about so so theologically the the doctrine of illumination spirit you know the Holy Spirit illuminating the doctrine through the scriptures into your eyes and in your heart and permeating through you that the Holy Spirit is actually helping you interpret and read and understand the scriptures right. as God intended them to be. Not as we're trying to secularize them and, and make them cute for public consumption. Now, <clears throat> that God is taking the words and telling you, okay, this is what I mean when I say this. Because scripture can, I mean, scripture is very black and white. And, and if you get basic and say, it, it says what it says, and it means what it says. So you don't think scripture is allegory or like... Oh, absolutely not. Okay. No, 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 no. This is not a, this is not, you know, Moby Dick. And we're trying to interpret, you know, what Melville was talking about when he wrote about the great white whale. No, I mean, the Bible is meant to be, inter it's not meant to be interpreted like, okay, well, he really meant this when he said that. No, 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 no. That's it, why I think the earth is flat. But anyways, <laughs> no one wants to hear that conversation. We'll talk about that later, why I believe the earth is flat. We'll save that for later. Well, the Bible supports it. The reason why I asked that is because in the beginning of Genesis, it's very vague in what happened with the earth. So, like, God created earth, and then the next verse, the earth is, like, without form, and it's like, so like something happened to it. Yeah. Because God doesn't create things out of order. You yeah. Know? But I also believe that man's uh, definition of time we still don't understand what actual time is. Yeah, you know what I mean? So like, uh, and I st I'm, st I'm still in this from, I think, Karina, I think she said that she was like, do you ever feel like you're somewhere for hours, but it's only minutes? Like, I don't, I, I, I don't think scientifically we still understand what time actually, that, that makes sense. time actually is. is. Like in the Greek, there's like chronos, and then there's like another Greek word of like time. Like there's like a spiritual time and like a, Earthly time. I know one of the words is Phonos. Well, here. And there's another Greek word. And after this, the we're, we're going to get into the early church. Theological nugget. God created time. In the beginning, time. God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, he created time, created heavens, space, earth, matter. So, right there. He created time, space, and matter mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the beginning. So that was the beginning of our existence or our potential to exist or whatever it was. But you got to remember, before all that, it was already done in God's head. In God's mind, all of this has already transpired. Right. You know, we talk about God. I mean, he is sovereign. He's, um, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omniscient, all-knowing, and omnipotent, all-powerful. Yeah. So... If you really want to, you do, you gotta remember, all of this right now, everything you see was all operating inside of God's mind before he even spoken into existence. Yeah. And then you really start to understand who you're dealing with, who he is. And also, I mean, since we're talking about, you know, Christianity, we're talking about the triune God, the whole, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They were all working in unison as, you know, <clears throat> triune God at the beginning. So just to debunk something that, you know, some of you may actually have in, in a belief or a misconception is 
Jesus has always existed. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus has existed as God has existed. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but like I've had arguments where people said Jesus never said I was God or the Son of God. But he does say I am that I am, which is God. That that's what God called himself with to Abraham. Mm-hmm. Oh, and um and Moses. So you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. So you know, him explaining himself and using parables to help us understand. And those of us that respond to his words are his. So, I mean, you know, somebody explained it to me. It was, you know, the, the, the father thought it, the son spoke it, and the spirit did it. So, you know, kind of understanding how they work in unison together, <laughs> but serve different functions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But never separated, always together. I mean, yeah. this, I mean, you start thinking about God, you start really, I mean, your head will hurt trying to understand all of God because we're finite, we are created beings, we are matter, and he is spirit, and he is beyond time, space, and matter. So I don't know if we would ever be, I mean, in our own flesh, you know, minds, be able to fully understand who God really is. Think about that. I mean, I don't think we're capable of it. I think our heads would literally explode. If we yeah. really were to be given the full knowledge of God, I don't think we could even handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. For me, that's when my imagination starts to run away. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But, I mean, God, I mean, and that's the thing is, like, everything with God is possible. Mm-hmm. Everything. So knowing who you are, I mean, and that's why theology is... Getting to know him from a scholarly perspective because that's just who I am. Now, I, I just I've always loved studying things. So <clears throat> exactly. So right. thanks. So let's uh, so let's get into you know like the early church. Mm-hmm. So let's I really want to talk about the split that that happened and how we've gotten Baptist and non denominationals and Presbyterian and etc. Let's just get like a give us a little educational segment. I don't think this, the way we do things is ever what, what Jesus intended. I mean, did he know it was going to happen? Absolutely. He's God. <laughs> Scripturally, there's one church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The body of Christ. Yeah. Christ is the head. We are the bride. We are the body. We make up the body of Christ. That is one church. So Christianity is intended to be one church. Yep. But we screwed it up, which we were going to do. I mean, God knew we were going to, you know, Adam was going to eat from the day, from the day that you eat of the tree. So God knows that, you know, we have capacity for sin. Mm-hmm. So a church split. So you're talking about, you know, the beginning of the Reformation when Martin Luther, you know, posted the 95 Thesis. What was going on with him at the time? So just to talk a little bit about Martin Luther, mm-hmm. he was a monk. So he, you know, monks are even, they're withdrawn. They're not just priests. They are, you know, basically decided to set themselves apart from the world to live as godly and holy a life as they possibly can. Yeah. To honor the Lord, to keep themselves as holy and accountable and separate. They did not want to mix with the world because they didn't want to encounter sin. So they want, they felt... Being away from the world and close to God would keep them holy. And in some ways, I mean, that makes sense, right? If you're yeah. not in the world, you're not watching TV and movies and reading the paper and you know, running around people, then you're, that's going to separate you from the world. So the temptations are fewer. I, I guess that would be a good mentality yeah. for that. But he was also an academic. So he was a professor of theology. He taught the Bible. So, and it's not seminary like we think about today, where anybody can go and enroll into at Liberty University or yeah. Regent University or one to. You had to actually be smart. <laughs> you were in. You were going into the into the yeah. priesthood. They only educated those that were going into the the priesthood or the elite, because back then, it, you know, education was to help the the elite maintain control. Mm-hmm. 
Right, not everyone can read and write. Yeah, not everybody could read and write. And if they could read and write, it wasn't necessarily in the right language. So the Bible at that time, um, the, the dominant languages of the Bible were Latin, which was the the church of the church, you know, the Church of Rome, the Catholic yeah. Church. Yeah, um, that was the language that they adopted. Greek was the other academic language at the time. So most Bibles were either in Latin or Greek. Yeah. So Martin Luther's in Germany. They didn't speak. You know, the common language was not Latin and Greek. It was German. That evolved from the Germanic tribes. So it was not the same language. So the the people in Germany at the time couldn't pick up a Latin or Greek Bible and make anything of it. I mean, the Greek, I mean, the Greek's a completely different alphabet. So they're, they're lost. They can't sit down and read the Bible for themselves. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther, who was trained and educated <clears throat> as, a, as a biblical scholar, could. And he started studying the scripture. And I believe the Holy Spirit was working on his heart at the time. And he started to realize... Well, some of the things the church church is doing isn't th this isn't okay. So, the church was one. Their teaching did not line up with the word of God. So the teaching was. They've almost made the church an idol. Believe that that they actually had made the church at that point an idol. I can believe it. Yeah, we cool. see we see it a lot right now. Even yeah, see yeah. light right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, again, keep your eyes open. Be careful because anything can become an idol. I mean, and there's, you know, ultra-reformed, hyper-Calvinist type people that the Bible actually becomes an idol. I yeah. Have, I have a question, though. So what exactly were the churches doing at the time that Martin Luther was like, uh, like it awakened him to do something about it? Uh, so check this out. They were doing what they call selling indulgences. So basically, you you were paying to get out from under sin. Um, so if you did X, Y, or Z, you would pay this amount of money to get out from under that sin. You'd be forgiven. So the, the church was having trouble raising funds. Sounds familiar. That happens all the time. Churches have trouble raising funds. It's not, yeah. a, it's not a new problem. So they were like, somebody came up with a great idea. Well, like, well, let's sell pardons, basically, you know, from certain sins. So if you did X, you'd pay that amount of money, and then you were forgiven. Wow. Yeah. Boom. Forgiven. And then they were also paying to get, get people out of hell. Yes. So you could pay X. You could it's pay crazy. $500 and get grandma out of hell, and the money went into the church. So the, it became this... Yeah. It be, yeah, it became this manipulation. It became this... I mean, evil, wicked business of profiting, not for God's glory. God wasn't getting the glory out of this. Where's God's glory in that system? I mean, think about it, though. That system is a system of lies. So it's, it's, a, it's a system of sin and manipulation. And manipulation, you know, in biblical context... Uh, and roots of, of what manipulation was is, is back then they would call that witchcraft and sorcery. Today we just call it manipulation, you know, psycho abuse or whatever you want to call it. But that's the way it was viewed back then is when people used their words to get other people to do things that were evil. So they manipulated the people to believe that they could get grandma out of hell for a fee. So Martin Luther's seeing this abuse, and, and he's like, this isn't right. So he turns to the scriptures, and he starts to study. And he starts to understand even more. I mean, and this is already a guy that's studied the Bible. He's got a degree in it. He teaches it. But he's teaching it from the Roman Catholic perspective. So when you go to church back then, they would read you the Bible, just the pieces they wanted you to know. So you couldn't sit down with your own Bible because there wasn't one available in your language. And this is, this is a problem you know, from the Reformation all the way here to the birth of the United States, was people fighting to get the Bible in their own language so they can understand it. 
It's interesting because um, the Bible was, um, well, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And they had access to the Greek Bible. Correct? Okay. So <coughs> most early transcripts are either Greek or Hebrew, Aramaic. Okay. So those languages. Greek was actually the dominant language of the Roman Empire. Okay. So you would think Italian would have been that. And Italian is a, is a derivative of Latin. They're, they're related languages. Mm. But Greek was the scholarly language of the, of, the, of the time of Jesus. So scholars believe that Jesus was fluent in Greek. <coughs> uh, they believe he was able to speak Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Um, but again, he's God. He could probably speak English back then that didn't even exist 2,000 years ago. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, you, you know, I mean, I know one of Stevie's favorites. I mean, he talks about the genius of Christ. Yeah, you did, you did talk yeah, about not, so not not just God incarnate, but the smartest <coughs> person to ever walk the planet because he knows everything. Mm. It's Christ; he's God, so he knows <coughs> everything. Now, I just found that interesting because there's people who bring up the argument that um, oh, the Bible has been translated and, tra and translated, but it's been translated directly from the original language, which was Greek yeah. and Hebrew. So there is no misrepresentation with it's, the with the Bible. This is what I think. I think we should uh, do a movie. Here we I go. I think movies are a form of preaching. It's like the uh, modern day of telling parables. That's what well, I think. Yeah, I mean, and this isn't canon. So, you know, I'm one of my, I mean, my family, we love watching The Chosen. And, and it's... You know, again, it's not canon. I mean, there's strong biblical elements in it, and they'll tell you, and they, 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 they own that up front, saying, hey, this is a show about the time of Jesus. Jesus is the central character. There are, you know, they take big chunks of the Scripture and, and put them in there. But one thing that Jesus says, and this is not in the Scripture, is he goes, our stories are what connects us. And I like that because, you yeah, remember, at the time of Christ, they didn't have Bibles then either. Yeah. It was all an oral tradition and letters. So, I mean, what we have, the epistles you know, that, that Paul wrote, were letters he was writing to those churches. And check this out, but most people don't think that Paul was the one actually writing it out. He was dictating these letters and somebody was writing them for him. And that's why there's some nuances in these that, you know, each, each book has, you know, because there may have been different scribes you know, di you know, taking the dictation from Paul. Yeah. But it was an oral tradition. They didn't have, I mean, there was no printing press back then. It was all passed down verbally. It, somebody was telling somebody about Jesus. Yeah. Or they would write a letter and, and, and talk, talk about Christ. But it survived. Right, yeah. Until they got it down on writing. And then they looked at it and said, we got to keep this for ourselves. Yeah. And that's what caused the split. That first big church split. Yep. Was, it was, a, it was, an, it was an argument over doctrine and theology. Yeah. And sin. Yeah. <clears throat> because the Catholic Church was in deep in yeah. sin. Good. So the takeaway from this conversation that we really want to push is that, you know, um, we hope that, that you guys really learned a lot about Pastor Mike, um, number one. He's definitely going to be, be on here again, right? He was amazing. Um, but we also wanted to educate you guys on this, on how the church became this. How we have so many denoms and all of this stuff. This is what started that. And we really want to drive just the, the point of that, you know, if you are a Christian, if you say that you are a believer in Christ, if question your pastor it's not it's, it's there's nothing wrong with asking questions that's how you learn the same way he sat with joe and asked him probably every question possible do the same take a leader and just get some coffee and just ask questions okay and um on this podcast we we, we really want to develop a community of learners a could and you know we're gonna have doctors on we're gonna have a bunch of different types of people where we want to develop a group of people that want to learn more and do more. So thank you guys so much for watching and listening. Have a wonderful day. First episode of the Essential Podcast done. Peace out. <laughs>